Uh, let's bow our heads just once more as we dive into God's word. Lord, we thank you so much for your scripture and what a reminder that you have woven into our daily rhythm, our weekly rhythm, um, and that is to gather together to be encouraged together, to sit under the authority of your word together, to apply the truths of the gospel together, to remind each other of the sweetness of salvation together, to encourage one another to strive for holiness together and to rejoice in the love of Jesus together. So we pray today, Lord, that that happens. Be with all of the hearts in here, those who know you, those who are coming to know you, and those who need to know you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. So if you haven't yet opened up your Bibles, you could open up to Psalm, or Proverbs excuse me, 13. We took a, kind of a long break over the Easter se- uh, season from our series in Proverbs, but now we are back in it. And the topic we're looking at today in Proverbs 13 is issues of satisfaction and of desire. And what's interesting is as I was thinking on it this week, I realized how subtly depressing even our language is around what we perceive to be satisfying or that we desire in our hearts. When you think about what satisfies you or what you desire, what do you think about? And then think about how you express that. How many of you have said before, if I could just pause time right here, this is where I wanna be. Or, You say, if I could go back to a certain season, if I could go back to a certain place, to a certain vocation, to a certain station in life, to a certain relationship, to a certain certain state of income, that would be wonderful. Or, if I had all the resources in the world, this is what I would do. And all of these betray a sad reality. And that is when we talk about things which we desire, things that we think will satisfy us, we actually speak of it in impossible hypotheticals, in situations which we know are never true. Unless you can pause time or control time or have infinite resources, the things we say will satisfy us are things that we can never actually be satisfied by. For those of you who have watched or listened to Hamilton, the musical, there's this central song in act one on the issue of satisfaction. And it drives the story of the rest of the play. And in the song, one of the characters at the conclusion of this joyous wedding begins a toast to the bride and to the groom, to the revolution. And at the end of it, what started out as this joyous occasion of two people finding satisfaction became a confession of this fear that this individual will never be satisfied. The lyrics of the song become a frequent callback as the play progresses. And in that moment, even the choreography is meant to express an unease around our ideas of satisfaction. The stage begins to rotate counterclockwise. The characters around her begin to move in slow motion as reality itself is distorted. It is the fastest song in the whole play of words per minute. And we are meant to feel the way in which this woman is encountering a reality which is passing her by and she has no ability to control. The director wants us to feel in our souls the unraveling of satisfaction. And this desire and fear of never being satisfied begins to characterize Alexander Hamilton as the reason behind rash decisions meant to gain satisfaction, but which ultimately lead to harm done to himself and to those around him. And as depressing as that is, to see it in beautiful uh, theatrical form and also in our own language, the Bible actually has hope for us. The Bible anticipates our struggle for desires satisfied. But that's why this text today is so beautiful in our world as spring is turning and sun is shining and we are excitable and we are looking for things that satisfy us and we wanna be nice and tan without mask tan lines on our face. This proverb begins with the premise that the believer starts satisfied. 
that the believer has what we see in our text today, desire fulfilled. They start with a full heart in the promise of God. And this is what we're going to see today, and that is this, is that submitting ourselves to satisfaction on God's terms fulfills our desires and shapes our life. Submitting ourselves to satisfaction on God's terms fulfills our desires and shapes our lives. And we're gonna see this in three ways. In Proverbs 13, 11, or six through 11, we're going to see the paradox of satisfaction. Then in verses 12 through 18, we're gonna see the humility of satisfaction. And then lastly, in verse 19, we're going to see the fruit of satisfaction. In other words, what we're gonna see is what true satisfaction is, how we get it, and how our lives are changed with it. Let's begin by looking at our first passage today, which is Proverbs 13, verses six through 11. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence, which is pride or arrogance, comes nothing but strife. But with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. So here as we read this, we encounter Proverbs and kind of the way we generally think of Proverbs, it's almost this riddle these series of contrasts and comparisons that leave us guessing. And this is where we see our first point today, and that is the paradox of satisfaction. The Proverbs are both a blessing and a curse to our modern mind because our minds are trained for these densely packaged little tweetable tidbits of information. They fit perfectly into our 120, well, Twitter used to be 120, I don't know what it is. It fits on our Facebook profiles and our Instagram bios and our Twitter accounts. It's packaged for us, and yet Proverbs demand a sort of thoughtfulness that we often find not worthwhile in our culture today. And so as these things sound kind of like candy sweet to our ear, they sound wise, we need to learn to pause and to consider what is actually being spoken. Because if we don't understand specifically verses six through nine of this text, we won't understand the rest of the text at all. And that's why I call this the paradox of satisfaction. A paradox, for those of you who want to call back to your high school English days, is just a seeming contradiction. And this passage seems to be filled with them. Paradoxes about riches and poverty. Paradoxes about life and death. Paradoxes about wisdom and wickedness, safety and danger. How do we begin to make sense of this? Well, Solomon bakes into verses 6 through 9 a structure that helps us understand what is going on. In verses seven and eight, you see there's this paradoxical picture of wealth and poverty, which we'll circle back to. But on each side of these paradoxes, straddling it and sandwiching it are two really clear statements on righteousness. Now let's read again verses six through nine. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. And so it's clear here that while wealth and security and poverty and riches are being discussed in the middle of this sandwich, the true guard and the true satisfaction, the true light and the true joy that is being discussed in these four verses is this idea of righteousness. In other words, when we want to, and most of us do because it's applicable, we all have money in our wallets and on our cards and in our Venmo accounts. But if we actually want to understand our heart towards our finances, our heart towards our desires, we need to understand our heart towards righteousness. We've talked about righteousness a lot in Proverbs, but since we haven't been here for a long time, I'll just give a quick review of what it is we talk about when we talk about righteousness. It's a word you might have heard in your church. We read it a lot in the Bible, but if we don't know what it is, then it'll be hard for us to actually understand what Solomon wants us to understand, not just in this passage, but in the whole book of Proverbs. When we encounter righteousness in this book, it is our window to the gospel. 
And that's because Solomon uses righteousness both as this subjective uh, expectation of the individual that you ought to pursue righteousness. That's one sense. But then he uses it in another sense, and that is that of an objective reality outside of you. That is that though you are called to act in righteousness, there is righteousness apart from you. And so on that subjective or an individual level, that's where Solomon expects the wise person to do what is righteous, to do what is blameless, to walk in what is upright. And so these are the commands we kind of flatten and generalize into two camps. To do what is good and to not do what is wrong. That's the individual subjective nature of righteousness. It is something you do. But that's also where we find the limit of subjective righteousness, isn't it? Because we have to answer the question, who defines what is good? Who defines what is right? Who defines what is wrong? And this is where we need the objective standard of righteousness. Righteousness, when used in verse six as it is, also expresses behind the word a type of loyalty to something outside of you, to something objective, not subjective, something apart from you. It implies that righteousness is faithfulness towards something. It could be towards, uh, like in any culture, a culture is created because people have some sort of righteousness or faithfulness to cultural status quos. But here, what stands behind the actions of the righteous, what stands behind the person who is pursuing right and not pursuing what is wrong is something objective, Not simply ethics in itself, not simply morality in itself, but what's actually behind those, which is the God of the Bible who is himself righteous. God is the standard of righteousness because he is pure, he is loving, he is just, he is safe, he is wonderful. And in order for us to see this here, we need to see that this righteousness he's prescribing to the blameless it guards them. It is of an immense benefit to you to encounter this objective righteousness. How are we guarded by this type of righteousness? Well, we see it's contrasted with this sin which destroys. It means the nearer we are to God, who is himself righteous, that means he is powerful, strong, just, loving, and pure, that God calls us to be near to him so that we get all of the benefits of his righteousness that we are so near to this wonderful God that we don't need to fear anything else. We get the benefit of that profound objective relationship by pursuing righteousness. And this is why God calls us to act righteously. And this is what God then gives. He gives his law to reveal what he's like. If God is righteous and that's our hope and he wants us to be like him, we need to know how we're to be like him. We know what it looks like to be like him. And so it's actually in God's law that he reveals a little bit of who he is. He shows us what it looks like to be good, to be pure, to be loving, to be just. Behind the laws is not just a God who loves rules. Behind the laws, a God who wants to be known and near to us. In fact, look at how the prophet Isaiah speaks of this in Isaiah 42, verse 21. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. God's law reveals his righteousness by showing us not only what God is like, but to show us how you can walk in such a way where all of God's beautiful likeness is a comfort to you where you reap all of the benefits of being near to a God like this. And so the premise was this, if the Israelites kept the law, and we read about that in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus and in Exodus, if they kept God's righteous law, God promised to be near to them. He would be their God and they would be their people. They would be righteous like God is righteous. He promised to dwell with them, to protect them. And this wonderful truth was that even if the people sinned and did not act like God, God gave them sacrifices to atone for their sins so they could still come by grace to the presence of God. But even though God's law was wonderfully capable 
of drawing people to God's righteousness. We see in the Old Testament that the hearts of the Israelites, and so to our own hearts, are incapable of walking in this kind of righteousness. Even righteousness with graces and helps like sacrifices, they wouldn't even keep them. They wouldn't even try. Their hearts refused to keep their part of the righteousness bargain, the subjective part. But this is where we see the good news of the gospel. Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Every one of them, Jesus fulfilled them perfectly. Jesus earned the objective standard of righteousness by himself subjectively fulfilling every perfect thing by only choosing what is good and refusing to do what is wrong. And the wonderful reality of redemption is is when we put our faith in Jesus and his works, we get God's objective righteousness. It is declared to us that we are just as righteous as Jesus who always fulfilled the law, even though we are those who broke God's law. So when Solomon is calling his readers to realize the benefit of righteousness, it means two things depending upon where you are in the story of God's redemption. First, to the Israelites, it means this world is crazy and there are going to be other nations trying to get you to worship other gods and trying to conquer you. But I promise you this, if you trust that following my law is your greatest good, then you will be well taken care of. You will stand near to the God who stands against your enemies. But then for us as Christians, this side of the cross, if we learn to trust in God's objective righteousness, not revealed in the law, but revealed in Jesus Christ and taken advantage of by faith in Jesus, then you have this security of a righteousness which guards you against all of these circumstances in your life. This righteousness satisfies us It protects us. It keeps us. It is a fire gentle enough to warm our cold hearts, yet powerful enough to destroy all that threatens us. And when you have a righteousness that guards you like this through the promise of God, then you don't need to trust in anything else. You don't need to trust in sin. And specifically, this is why Solomon brilliantly leverages the issue of wealth so stunningly. Here we have this righteousness which guards, protects, and provides by grace through God's covenant. And then he begins to talk about wealth. And this is really interesting because when we talk about wealth, most people, I'm assuming, don't consider themselves to be wealthy. And so what we do is we say, okay, Solomon's giving a warning against wealth. I'm not wealthy, therefore I don't have to to do this. I can't apply it. (laughs) I don't have the means to apply it. But what's interesting here is Solomon is not critiquing wealth. He's critiquing the hope of wealth, which is a hope that even the poorest person in the world might have, which means this applies to all of us, those who have and those who have not, which is why he begins with this illustration of the poor man who tries to be rich. Haven't we seen this plot line on TV or in movies before, played out thousands and thousands of times, whether to impress a date or to get a job, The character goes to great lengths to appear to be rich, successful, whatever it is, so that he might get the affirmation of whomever he's trying to woo in that moment. Why do they do this? Why is it comical to us? Well, it's comical to us on one hand because it never works, and yet we do it all the time. But on the other hand, they do it because they think that if they can appear to be wealthy, that wealth often provides some standard of acceptance, some desire, some satisfaction. And if they can sell others that they have that, it will open up real tangible provisions in their own life. A real chance at intimacy, a real hope at a job, a real possibility of a steady income. But this is contrasted here, the poor man who tries to be rich, with the rich man who is actually poor. The rich man whose life isn't laden with gold or gadgets, but instead he lives his life as if he does not have wealth. And this is intentional. And this is kind of countercultural for our era because I think most of us, if we're honest, have accepted this idea of whatever, if you happen to get a raise, if you happen to come into money, that your lifestyle should rise to meet whatever that income is. And yes, so too should your generosity to churches and missions But we have this understanding that seems to be innate in profitable countries 
that it's actually our level of income which drives our consumer habits and the benefit and the nice things we have in our lives. But this man refuses to do that. This man, though being incredibly wealthy, lives as though he's poor. Why is that? Because he knows the reality of the world through the eyes of the wise. Look at this, verses eight through 11. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. The wise man knows the realities behind our wealth. He knows we see it, that there is a danger to a get rich quick scheme, which let's try saying that five times fast on a microphone with a sunburned face, um, that there's this danger of a get rich quick scheme in verse 11. And he says that whatever that is, the promise of that is fleeting. It doesn't exist. It might promise you riches, but in whatever way, it's either deceitful or uncharitable and it's not worth it. But he also knows this unique paradox, which is really interesting to ponder on. That is this. He says, if a rich man is, has someone in their home kidnapped, he has the wealth to purchase back his family member who was kidnapped. We would expect Solomon to say next, but the poor man does not have the ability to buy back ransom. But that's not what he says, is it? Instead, he says, the poor man hears no threat. In other words, no one wants to steal from the man who appears to be poor and extort him because they don't think they'll get anything in return. I was thinking of this um, just in terms of uh, another kind of word story that shows how easily we can be trapped by what we have. And as we're called to pursue righteousness, that includes generosity. And think of it this way. If you are driving a 1992 Ford Taurus with 180,000 miles on it, and someone asks to borrow your car, you'll probably do so willingly and be very generous with it. If you're driving a 2021 Tesla and someone asks to borrow your car, you're gonna be a little more closed-handed with it, aren't you? Or a little more anxious. Or even so, the person who you lend it to is gonna be terrified to even drive out of the driveway. You have it, but in a way, you're held captive by it. And the point Solomon is making here with this man who has wealth to pay the ransom and the poor man who receives no threat is that wealth can at the same time in our hearts coexist in this weird tension that it can be our savior, but it can also be our present enslaver. It can provide us salvation, but it also provides the problem from which we need to be saved. And that's the nature of sin. When we don't trust that God is sufficient, when we don't trust that walking in faithfulness to God is actually what guards us, then we will turn to gold or to lust or to affirmation or to Facebook likes or to locations to provide for us what we think God is lacking of. But whenever we have those resources that we think will satisfy us, we realize that sometimes righteousness demands those from us. Sometimes God in his wonderful provision demands our time, demands our adventure, demands our finances. Or the world looks at what we have and they demand it. And we have to expend it. And when we expend it, we get a little bit of happiness because we've delivered ourselves. But once we've spent it, we now have less of it. And now we need to get more of it. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on as we are constantly taxed for what we claim to possess. Sin leads us with the premise of something, promise that will never endure. And that's why Solomon says here at the end, he says, the light of the righteous rejoices forever, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Solomon has already mentioned this theme of light and look at what it leads us to in Proverbs 6, verse 23. It says this, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way to life. What is the light of the righteous? 
the light of the righteous is God's covenant in his word that he will provide. The righteous person knows God's promise of righteousness will always stand in front of them and they will never be at loss. They will never be stolen. They will never run out of ransom funds in the circumstances of life. But on the flip side, those who put their trust in the worldly lamp that illuminates all the glitter of life, that will soon be snuffed out. That will not endure. To follow that hope is to be inevitably crushed when the candle is snuffed. But here in God's word is a hope that leads to rejoicing that cannot be threatened. Trusting in God's righteousness looks like not trusting in the world's righteousness. Trusting in God's provision to save according to his word does not look like trusting in the promise of the world's word. But it's this light of righteousness, the righteousness we see in the gospel where Jesus took away the debt of our sin and gave us his perfect relationship with God that always leads us to rejoice. And that sounds great on paper, but the truth is to actually live that out in life takes immense humility. And this is our next point today. This is the humility of satisfaction. Read with me verses 12 through 18. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. In everything, the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. So here in this passage, we see a couple of really key statements. Then we see a bunch of warnings to those who refuse to believe those statements. And this statement that we see first is hope deferred. Maybe you've heard this. one of those famous proverbs that maybe you've seen in your life before. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so psychologists call this phenomenon delayed gratification. It's this idea that if you are emotionally capable and strong enough to resist the immediate promise of reward, this delayed hope causes that future reward, that delayed gratification to be sweeter. And to a large degree, it's the acceptance of what we saw earlier, that wealth gained hastily does not satisfy, that they're in it for the long run. But there's one fatal error Solomon points out here about this. He's talking about this ultimate satisfaction. He's talking about a hope that one day your life will be well lived, that you will look back and say, all of this has been worth it. But sometimes we even play the long game and it doesn't work out to satisfy us. There are many people who, for whatever reason, maybe it's bathed in some sort of religiosity or some sort of uh, ethic or philosophical position where we accept that riches and wealth and lust and adventure, that those don't actually satisfy. And so what they do is they admit to playing the long game. That, you know, I'm gonna just strive to be a good person. I'm gonna strive to love those who are around me, to be a good dad, to be a great sister, to be an excellent employee, to steward God's creation well, to be generous with my finances. And our hope in doing that is that when all is said and done, that even though we will have denied ourselves so many things in the present, we might be able to look back on our deathbed or maybe even whatever eternity you think is to come and say, man, that was worth it. I am satisfied. But the problem is that life lived only for those motivations will never satisfy because it never actually deals with the problem of dissatisfaction. Our problem is not that we lack satisfaction. That's a symptom. Our problem is that we were created to enjoy God and be satisfied in him forever, but our sin separated us. 
we have rejected against this wonderfully righteous and pure God. That's the first sin in the garden. Adam and Eve's first sin was thinking that God wouldn't satisfy. They were deceived to think that God was holding out on them. And if they could, could live their own life, they would find greater joy in choosing their own will instead of God's will. Behind all of our language of joy and satisfaction, behind the aching of our wants and needs is the reality of life and death where sin has broken us, where we have rebelled and earned death, where God desired for us to rejoice in him and find life. Sin promises joy and pays in death, but here God offers a call to have your desire fulfilled so sweetly that instead of being an anemic twig scrounging for whatever nutrients we can find, we become a tree of life with fruit that ever satisfies us right here and right now. That is the wonderful provision of Christ in the gospel that you might come and not eke out joy, but that you might come and regardless of what is out there, you might have your desire fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And what does it take to do that? Nothing but coming to Christ by grace, repenting and believing and tasting his goodness. And all of the verses in this passage, they play in this riddle form. You know, part one, they state something in the positive. Part two, they state something in the negative. But in verse 14, he breaks that mold so as to really impress on us his main point in this text. Look with me at verse 14. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. What does Solomon want you to see? If you want your desire fulfilled, if you want true satisfaction, if you want true life, then listen to the teaching of God's wisdom and turn away from the path of death you're on right now. How do we turn away from death? By turning towards God. Where does God reveal himself? Well, time and time again in this text, we see this language of what God is communicating. We've seen the light of the righteous, the advice of the wise, the word preached to the wicked, the commandment received by the humble, the teaching of the wise, and the instruction rejected by the fool. God has put out a message. He has spoken his word, and those who wish to be satisfied will listen to it. The problem is not that we haven't heard it. The problem is that the word that we have heard is often so contrary contrary to the word of the world. It's so contrary to what the world says satisfies. In fact, look at Jesus' words in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 37. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Jesus is after this ransom. He's after this promise of wealth or whatever you think wealth might buy. And he says, denying yourself and following me is how you escape all of that. Following Jesus sounds great. It sounds really good, but the other side of following Jesus is not following the world. Following what Jesus says gives us joy is saying no to what the world says gives us joy. In 2020, Netflix posted an annual revenue of 25 billion dollars. That's more than McDonald's on a global scale. But did you know that in the early 2000s, Netflix came to a little video store you might have heard of called Blockbuster and offered to be bought out. I think it was for the price of five million dollars. Blockbuster said no. Why? They were the giant. They had the industry figured out. They felt they knew exactly what it took to thrive in this new digital age and they were making steps to do it. But 21 years later, Netflix is king and Blockbuster no longer exists. What's the point? 
look at how in verses 13 through 18, Solomon is giving us example after example after example of what it looks like to be blockbuster and to say no to what seems like it won't work time and time again. Listen to this rhythm, Solomon points. Listen to the picture of God's wisdom. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. In everything, the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof will be, excuse, whoever he, heeds reproof will be honored. So here he's saying, don't be the one who hears all of this and says in his heart, I know how to adapt. I know how to find satisfaction in this world on my own. This is something that Moses warned of in Deuteronomy chapter 29, where he said this, verses 18 through 19. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. What is this root? What is contrary to the tree of life? One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, that is the words of God's righteousness in Jesus Christ, blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of the moist and the dry alike our hearts will hear the wonderful message of grace and provision in Jesus Christ, but we will wrestle and stubbornly refuse to live as if Jesus actually satisfies. We place our hope in the things of this world. We try to gain life in whatever way the world tries to call us to gain. All the while, Jesus' promise of joy is sitting there untapped because we will not humble ourselves and trust God's word. But when we see who Jesus is on the cross, when we see he is the all-sufficient son of God who kept God's righteousness, who has opened a door for us to come back into God's grace, to be with him forever, to be satisfied by the king who created the cosmos, then we see that this is a Christ worthy to be trusted, that his promise is not empty, his word is not for our harm, but he means for our joy. So where are you trying to affirm faith in Jesus while refusing to humbly take Jesus at his word? I was super convicted by this text this week because I could point to like five places in my life where I know I'm doing things because I want them to provide something that only Jesus can provide. And that's great. We should enjoy all the things of this world. But the problem is not do we enjoy it. The problem is what do we expect to get from it? And there are many things in this world where I try to claim that Christ is my all-satisfying joy, but I turn to other things to actually bring the satisfaction, the protection, and the fulfillment that only Jesus can fulfill. Where are you willing to be seen as the poor man in the eyes of the world who gives away what the world says you should die to keep in order to be satisfied in Jesus? Because here's the thing, we're talking about this in a moment, the world will see you as an absolute fool to give away what the world desires. It does not make sense in their mind. But it is our joy to trust Christ. And here in conclusion, Solomon gives us a place to immediately apply this text. And this is the final point today. This is the fruit of satisfaction. Look with me at verse 19. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. How do we apply this text? We become so satisfied in the sweetness of the gospel that we are eagle, eager to turn away from what is evil and to savor what is good. I want to share with you guys a story that I want to preface this story first, that I'm not a miserable glutton. 
I do have some aspect of self-control, but I also like to forgive me when I eat a meal, be full. That's kind of the goal of it. With that said, when Sarah and I go out on a date, sometimes we'll go to a fancier restaurant and I know that these fancier restaurants charge you lots of money for little bits of food. And so what I do is before we go, I'll, I'll eat something like a meal and then I'll go to the restaurant. And I do that because I know that if I go to the restaurant famished, that one of two things will happen. One, I will try to fill my need and I will find myself unable to afford anything from that point on. I will try to eat to be satisfied and I will realize I don't have the capacity to be satisfied at this price. Or I will say, sweetheart, I'm just glad to be here with you. I'm gonna just order this like $28 bowl of lettuce and savor it with you because you're so satisfying. But on the inside, I have this craving desire that says I enjoy nothing. <laughs> You white knuckle your way into saying no to the thing that your stomach is crying out for and will be forever pained by. This is the dilemma of thinking the sins of this world will ever satisfy you. You will either spend and spend to gain what the world can never offer because you do not have the capacity to purchase it. You will indebt yourself to a product that will never be given. That is a sad place to be. Or else you will out of some stoic desire, white knuckle yourself away from lust, money, power, or adventure only to live life with this all-consuming hunger pain that burdens you wherever you go. And just on an evangelistic level, just on a cultural level, I love what Solomon says here. And maybe it speaks into your heart or maybe it speaks into your heart to our unbelieving world around us. He says that desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but that it is an abomination for the fool to turn away from evil. It is an abomination for the fool to turn away from what he thinks will actually satisfy him. Does that make sense? That means when the world is so vehemently against the way Christians are living or the calls of a Christian to give up Christ and, or to give up their life and to follow Christ with their wealth, with their sexuality, with the whole of their lives, they will respond vehemently towards us. Because we are not just calling them to turn from one thing to another. We are calling them to turn from what they think is their very life. And they will, it will be an abomination to them. It will not make sense to them. And how our hearts ought to hurt for those who are enslaved in sin. And maybe that is you today where where you see these calls, it is an abomination to let go of what your heart chooses to cling to. But here is the wonderful promise of the gospel. It starts with desire fulfilled. It starts with a full stomach before you go into the restaurant of the world. It eats richly and abundantly in the free kitchen of Christ's mercy so that we can say without white knuckle and with a wallet brimming, that we have been satisfied. You see, the paradox of the gospel is, is this, is that sometimes we invert things. It's not that we misunderstand the call to be righteous. It's that we invert where our righteousness shows up. Many of us think that if we want the satisfaction of God, we must learn to say no to sin. But the wonderful promise is actually that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have received the satisfaction of God so that you can say no to sin. Christ fills the stomach of the famished man with mercy so that he can turn from the deceitful treasures of wicked desert and savor Christ in Christ abundantly. In this way, as we learn to say no to sin, that is the greatest sign of your satisfaction in Jesus. But more than that, it is this, this self-perpetuating wonderful thing where as we, out of satisfaction, say no to sin, we encounter that in that moment of saying no, Christ still satisfies us. It fills us all the more. I don't know if this is a guy thing, but when you get a car, the first thing you look at is how high the speedometer goes, and then you say, can I hit that? My minivan has 120 miles per hour on that thing. 
It can hit it. (laughs) We have this innate tendency to test the limits of something. And here, Solomon is showing you the sweetness of the gospel, the all-satisfying premise of righteousness in Christ, not based off what you have done, but based off what Jesus has done. And he says to you, floor it. Try and find its limit. Try and find its edge. Try and drain the satisfaction poured out for you on the cross and you will not find it. There is no limit to this satisfaction because even when the world bites us with the pang of death, we know through the righteousness of Jesus there is new life everlasting in a new heavens and a new earth. So we pursue righteousness and are guarded by it in Jesus Christ to live a life of deep satisfaction even in a world that is constantly dissatisfied. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you give us the ability to taste what our hearts on our own cannot. Lord, following Christ is a humbling and countercultural call that we cannot do apart from your Holy Spirit filling us, satisfying us, and urging us onward. Lord, I pray today that in our weaknesses, Lord, in this body, our physical pains, there is mental anguish, there is financial distress, there are family issues that wage war, that break our hearts because sin has affected our world and our lives in ways we cannot imagine. But praise be to God who has delivered us from the punishment of sin today and will ultimately deliver us from the final consequence of sin in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, draw our roots deeper and deeper into desire fulfilled so that we might endure joyfully, that we might be guarded by righteousness, that we might see the sweetness of satisfaction in your mercy, and in so doing, turn away from what is evil and pursue what is good, because we have been saved by the God who is good. We pray all of this in your name, amen.